Our sermon text this morning is a continuation of readings we've been doing through the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, we've reached chapter 4, uh, verse 17 in Ephesians. And in this particular reading, after explaining uh, the importance of growing into spiritual maturity, Paul describes what it looks like for us to live a new life in Christ. He writes, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a junior in college, I learned about the sniff test. If you don't know what the sniff test is, I would refer you to the picture on the cover of the bulletin. See, I had moved into a very old dormitory, and it only had one laundry room, and it was in the basement of the dormitory. And because they were old machines, at any given time, about half of them were not working, and the other half were being used by someone else. And it wasn't a place that you could actually sit and study or anything, so it was kind of hit and miss. You had to keep going down to the laundry room and try to get in before somebody else to wash your clothes. As a result, we learned to use the sniff test. That is, can I wear this shirt for a fourth time before anyone notices? You know, in the winter, that was pretty easy. And do I really need to wash this pair of jeans this week? Because I just washed them last week. And I mention that because I want to talk about discerning. About discerning using a, an image that Paul uses in that reading that I just read. Because when he talks about putting off, he's not using a word that means, uh, or putting on something. He's not talking about faking. He's talking, he's using the same Greek words that would be used if you were to take off clothing and put on clothing. And at the end, you notice that he says we should imitate God, who in Christ was a pleasing aroma to his Father. That is, how do we become a pleasing aroma to God, as opposed to, my favorite Old Testament idiom, which is a stench in God's nostrils. It turns out that Jesus actually used this imagery as well. You may be familiar with a parable that Jesus told about a great king whose son was getting married. And in Jesus' day, wedding receptions were a much bigger deal than nowadays. They would go on for days you would be treated to the very best food and wine, and it was an excuse to take time off for people who worked very hard and didn't get nearly as much time off as we did, as we do. 
and, uh, and you would be treated. And in this case, it was a king that was throwing this banquet for his son's marriage. So it would be the very finest in the kingdom. But then there's a shocking twist. The people who were the, the nobles and the wealthy that, that were invited to this wedding feast, one after another send the king excuses why they can't come. Oh, I've got this business and I'm just too busy and this is going on and that's going on. And they insult the king by not coming to his son's wedding banquet. And the king is furious and so he sends his servants out because he can't have an empty or even half-empty banquet hall for this great occasion. He sends his servants out to invite in the poor and the needy, the vulnerable, people who can't believe their good luck because they would never be worthy to, to go to this banquet for the king's son's wedding. But here they are invited in to this banquet hall. And then there's another shocking twist in this story. And that is the king, as he walks through the crowd of people that are enjoying this lavish feast, this great thing, he comes across a man who's not wearing wedding clothes. He's not wearing the appropriate clothes. And he's furious and he throws the man out because he's insulted the king. And when I was growing up, I thought this was incredibly unfair. After all, he invited in the poor. And, you know, in Jesus' day, nobody, including royalty, had as many clothes as you and I do in our closets. And most people had maybe one set of clothing that they would wear out before they could afford, you know, could buy a new pair of clothes. And so why was he upset at this man? Well, then I learned that it was the habit in Jesus' day for the host of a wedding feast to give gifts to those participating. In our day, we bring gifts for the bride and the groom. In Jesus' day, it was the host of a feast like this who gave gifts to all those participating. And the most common gift a greatly valued gift was a new set of clothes. In other words, this guy had received new clean clothes from the king, something appropriate to wear to this wedding feast, and he hadn't put them on. For whatever reason, he had insulted the king. He hadn't grasped the gift that he had been given. And of course, this, this parable, this story is about us, because you and I have no reason to believe that, that we should spend eternity with a holy God in the, the, what Scripture calls the marriage feast of the Lamb, when Jesus, his Son, and, and we are united in eternity. We have no reason to believe we deserve that. But it's not just eternal life that Christ came to give us. He came to give us new spiritual life now. New spiritual life where we become different people, where we become more like God. And so how do we do that? How do we discern that? Because, you know, the sniff test doesn't work if your dorm room stinks. That is, if you're surrounded by stench, you're not going to be able to tell whether your clothes are clean or not. And the same is true if you have a cold. You're not going to be able to use the sniff test. And you and I live in a world that's very different from the way that God intended it to be. Very different from heaven. I know we're out here. This is the closest we can get. But even the best of this life is just a glimpse, just a, a taste of what God has prepared for us in heaven. So how do we know what pleases God? What's a pleasing aroma to him? Well, this is what Paul's talking about in this reading. When he tells people that, that they ought not to live the way that they have lived. And so I want to summarize that in, in four points. And the first is... He calls us to be not sensual, but sensitive. He says the nations are futile in their thinking and darkened in their understanding. They are separated from God, not only because they are ignorant, but because they are hard-hearted. He says, having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with continual lust for more. Some of you... Uh, no, and I may have used this illustration before, but when I think of insensitivity, I think of my fingers. Because I generally play guitar a couple times a week, but when I was down in Boise for cancer treatment, uh, I didn't play guitar. Maybe picked it up for five minutes, that whole long five weeks. And so my calluses were no longer. 
my fingers got sensitive, and the next time I picked up guitar, it hurt to play. And Scripture says that's how our hearts are as well. And I've read accounts of people who've done horrific things, criminals who say, well, it was hard the first time, but not as hard the second time. And after three or four times, they didn't feel anything. And that's the way sin is. When we repeat the same behavior over and over again, we lose sensitivity to the fact that this is not God's will. And so we're called to become more sensitive. I've actually had people who came to Christ and a couple months after that, they would tell me that they actually felt a bit worse than they did beforehand. And I'd say, well, why is that? And they'd say, well, I didn't realize that these things were wrong, that, that I was offending God by these behaviors. And I had to assure them, that's the Holy Spirit working on you. God wants us to be sensitive to right and wrong, to be more sensitive to right and wrong than the people around us, more sensitive to our culture. Paul says, you did not come to know Christ by callous wrongdoing or by pursuing pleasure, but by being sensitive to guilt and pain and deep need. And that's difficult in our world. It's difficult in a world where sex sells and it's used to sell an amazing variety of things. It's difficult in a world where, where violence is admired and where cheating and lying is excused as just the way that things are. But Jesus revealed the truth that these things stink to high heaven, that they are not acceptable to God, and that we are called to be different, that we were, as Paul puts it, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, which means the word holiness means to be set apart for a purpose, that we're to be different. We're set apart for God's work. This is who we were created and recreated in Christ to be. It's not a weakness, it's a strength to be sensitive, but not sensual. The second thing I, I want to bring out about what Paul says is we're called to be not rancid, but righteous. I use the word rancid because it reminds me of a, a time when I was growing up and my, my brother and I, we rode our bikes to a, a friend's house and he lived uh, next door to his grandfather, but between his house and his grandfather's house, there was a huge field of, you know, probably an acre on which his grandfather grew a wide variety of vegetables. And this was late in the season. And so a lot of the squash and the tomatoes, if they weren't perfect, they were just left in the field to rot, which meant that they were perfect for a vegetable fight. <laughs> These squashes were like water balloons, man. When they hit you, they just exploded. And the tomatoes, it was like paint paint gun fights without the gun. I mean, you would mark each other with the tomatoes. It was awesome. And then it got late and we got on our bikes and we rode home and my mom would not let us in the house. No way. We had to strip down in the garage. We had to go straight to the shower, shower off and put on new clean clothes before we could come to the dinner table. And Paul's obviously not talking about vegetables. He's talking about our behaviors our behaviors, when he says things like put off falsehood and speak truthfully, truthfully. I don't know if any of you have seen, have you, have you seen any of the ads for the campaign, uh, He Gets Us? Anybody seen those? I, I've seen a number of them. They had one during the Super Bowl last year. I've seen them online and, and uh, on the screen. And this is actually, a, uh, these ads direct you to a website that invite you to understand Jesus. That's the he the one who understands us. And this past week I went to one, I'd seen an ad um, where they have various people who are immigrants, whose uh, English is not their first language, and they ask them, you know, what's hard to say? And they'll say a word in English like vulnerable. That's a tough word for people from other languages to say. And they'll say, no, no, no. What's hard to say emotionally? And they have some great stories on their website, and one of them I looked at is, is from a woman who said, I was wrong. She said early in her life she could not admit that she was wrong. Because she felt that if she admitted she was wrong, that no one would love her, that she had to be right, or she would be unloved. And then she met Christ, and she came to understand 
that God loves us in spite of our sins. And she was able to admit when she was wrong because she understood that there was someone who loved her in spite of all the wrong that she'd done. In spite of the fact that she was going to do wrong in the future, that she was going to make mistakes. And suddenly she could admit to other people when she was wrong. That's speaking truthfully, something that we, because of our human nature, have trouble doing. Your, my wife will tell you, I'm one of them. We have trouble admitting that we're wrong. There's another video on there where there's a man who, who grew up in a household where the father, his father, was very into machismo and very harsh with him and very unaccepting and didn't give him any of the love he desired. So the words that he had trouble saying were, I forgive you. He still, late into adulthood, was struggling to forgive his father. Because when we've been hurt by someone, or when we're scared of someone, it produces anger, and it makes it so hard for us to love someone, to be angry and to love them at the same time. But notice what Paul says about anger. We're going to get angry, but he says, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. That is, don't let it last for more than a day. Reconcile. This is what we're called to in Scripture, and it's, it's very different from our culture. You know, I know people whose families understood anger to be a free pass. If you were angry, then any horrible behavior towards the other person was acceptable. But that's not the way that God treats us. Scripture talks about the wrath of God, and for him, it's not just some flyaway emotion. It's the fact that our offenses against him, our maker, our redeemer, deserve punishment. But he doesn't punish us for them. You know, Paul says the reason that we need to get over that is because we are all members of one body. Think about that for a minute. When you stub your toe, it hurts. So you take a hammer and smash it to punish it, right? No. What you want to do is you want to ease that pain and you want to heal that member of your body. But when we're angry with each other, what do we want to do? We want to exact revenge. revenge. Like it's our place to judge the other person. It's like it's somehow going to make it better if we can hurt that other person to the extent that we've been hurt. And scripture says this is foolish. And praise God, that's not the way he treats us. But in fact, he poured out his wrath on his own son so that you and I will never face the punishment that we deserve. Instead, we're invited to that feast in heaven with Jesus. That's why he's the guest of honor. And we get to spend eternity there with someone who loves us unconditionally, who desires the best for us. And along with that best is his desire that we learn to imitate him, that we learn not to fight fire with fire, but fight fire with water. Reconcile that division. And that doesn't mean that we don't, you know, speak to other people, that we don't ever point out what's wrong. But in, in the passage we had last week, Paul says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. That is, he himself gives an example. He says, those who've been stealing should do something else, something useful. And steal no longer so that they have, and notice this, something to share with those in need. Because that's the purpose, isn't it? That's the purpose why, why we work hard. It's not to get more stuff for ourselves. It's so that we can help those who are in need. Because that's the way God is. He pours out the riches of heaven on us. We're called to behavior that's not ranches, but rancid, but righteous in the way that God is righteous. Then Paul goes on and, and says our words. Our words are not to be horrible, but helpful. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I probably don't need to tell you that we are inundated with unwholesome talk and with people who use their words to tear others down. I'm not 
talking about swearing. That's the least of it. I'm talking about ripping people apart with sarcasm, ripping people apart with direct attacks. You know, I grew up in a kind of rough neighborhood, and, and uh, that was the way that people talked in that neighborhood. The school was brutal that way. But then I, I moved to a place that was more positive, and, and then in college, I learned a valuable lesson in a speech class. And it wasn't from any of the speeches, it was actually from the way that the instructor graded the class. See, everybody in the class had to fill out an evaluation of everyone else's speeches. And there were certain things that we had to comment on, but we learned that we would likely be next. So you needed to be very positive and constructive in your criticism. But also because that's the way that God speaks to us. In the scriptures, he reveals the truth to us, but he doesn't do it to tear us down. He does it in order to bring us to the point where we understand his love. He does it in order to build ourselves up and build other people up through their words, to build each other up as a body. And Paul goes on to talk about how we are to be imitators of God in this as dearly loved children. I don't know if any of you had this experience with your children, I'm betting that you did, but uh, my daughter started talking early, um, shortly after one, and before she was two, I noticed that she used the word actually a lot, which is kind of an unusual word, you know, for a toddler, actually. And I thought, do I say it that much? Actually, I did. <laughs> But this was a positive thing when her little brother came along uh, because I heard her saying positive things to, to him, things that she had heard her parents say, like, good job, and you can do it, and uh, it'll be okay. Because that's what dearly loved children do. They imitate the parents who love them. And that's what we're called to do, imitate the God who spoke peace and hope into us by speaking it into each other. And the last thing I want to point out is Paul talks about being not malicious, but mimicking God. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate. Why? He says, as in Christ, God forgave you. And later, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. You know, a number of years ago, there, was, uh, there were a number of people wearing bracelets that said WWJD, which is really a pretty simple sniff test, isn't it? What would Jesus do? That's the question. If you want to know what pleases God, take a look at Jesus. What did he do? What would he do in this situation? I heard a story once about a a mother who was making pancakes for her sons and she was just using a, a, a flat uh, cast iron skittle and, and so she made a big pancake and she said, okay boys, the first pancake's ready, which one of you gets it? And her two sons started to fight viciously over this one pancake until she stopped them and she said, you know Jesus would let his brother have the first pancake. And so the one brother looked at the other and said, okay Tommy, you be Jesus. <laughs> We all want other people to be Jesus towards us. But God calls us into the world to be Jesus to others. To not just tell them, but show them the love of God, the love by which we are accepted no matter what, the love by which we look forward to this eternal life in the presence of God. John writes, For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that they, through him, might have everlasting life and he sends us into the same into the world with the same message the same message the message of God's not condemnation but God's loving sacrifice for us and so we are called to imitate God in that I have to tell you this sermon was uh, heavily influenced by the the fact that I had to wash our dogs this week uh, we have a big field around our house and our dogs find the stinkiest stuff to roll in. 
I mean, it's really bad. In the winter, not a problem. Snow. In the summertime, I don't know what, and I don't want to know what they're rolling in. But this past week, uh, you know, and they're German shepherds. We can't wash them in the house. We take them outside, rub them down with Dawn dish soap, hose them off repeatedly. And I wish that they had the discernment to know <laughs> what aroma is pleasing to us. <laughs> because the aromas that are pleasing to them, I guarantee you, are not pleasing to us and wouldn't be to you either. And it kind of makes me wonder, don't you think that God wishes we had the discernment to know what's pleasing to him? To what is a pleasing aroma to him? And so he sent his spirit out to us. He's given us his word that you and I might be like Christ, a pleasing aroma to God. In Jesus, amen.